Hotel. It's Taku. Chihuntuman. Greetings and thank you for joining us today as we launch our Diversity Week activities. Before we get started, I would like for us to engage in a moment of silence to pay homage to the lives lost this year due to COVID, as well as trauma related to trauma, racial, cultural, and social injustices, especially the unrest in black and brown communities. I also would like for us to recognize the land of the indigenous people, many of whom lost their lives to genocide and were forced to leave their land. The, the land held by the ice, Apalachi, Calusa, Tumuco, and Tococo Bago tribes. The Seminole tribe of Florida and the Mikusu tribe of Indians of Florida are two of the three federally recognized Seminole nations along with Seminole nations of Oklahoma. Currently, there are six Seminole tribe of Florida reservations across the state of Florida. The Seminole tribe did not exist until it was created by the Seminoles in 1957. The Seminole people are the descendants of many Native Americans who have inhabited Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and parts of South Carolina, Tennessee, and Mississippi for at least 12,000 years. They lived as hundreds of separate tribes when the Spaniards arrived in 1510. Over the last almost 500 years, however, as their descendants have endured disease and warfare, the survivors of numerous Mascoki tribes grouped together in Florida around the core of Cimarrones, refugees from the Spanish Florida missions. Only after 1770s, when the first English speakers entered Florida, where they called Seminoles, Seminoles. Today, the entire group bears their anglicized name, Seminoles. Let us please observe a moment of silence to honor our individuals and our ancestors. Good afternoon, Knights, and welcome to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion's Diversity Week kickoff. My name is Kavita Sao, and I am a coordinator in ODI, and I will be your host for the first part of this program, after which Dr. Jonathan Cox will join Dr. Butler to take us through the Q&A directly after the keynote. UCF Diversity Week is a celebration of our diverse community and an opportunity to explore topics across the broad range of human identity, experience, and interaction. UCF is a public institution that supports every individual's First Amendment right to express their opinion in a peaceful manner. As a university, we believe that offering our community the opportunity to consider all viewpoints is part of our educational mission. Our celebration of Diversity Week is just one way that we do that. You may have noticed that things are a tad bit different this year, but that will not stop us from having an incredible Diversity Week. So to help us kick off the 28th UCF Diversity Week celebrations, it gives me absolute pleasure to introduce to you the leader of this great university, President Alexander Cartwright. Thank, thank you so much, Kavita, and thank you all for being with us virtually today to help kick off this very incredible week. I want to thank everyone who's made this week possible and to welcome all of our highly distinguished speakers to UCF. I'm honored to be here to celebrate one of UCF's greatest strengths, the diversity of our people, our students, faculty, and staff, and their lived experiences and perspectives. This week is about much more than just diversity. It's about inclusive excellence and recognizing how our diversity makes us all better. The theme of this year's Diversity Week is Stronger Together. And I could not agree more. We are stronger together. Our collective commitment to inclusive excellence is critical to achieving our shared goals 
which includes becoming one of the leading metropolitan research universities in the country and the world. I've been here for a little over six months and I already love so much about this institution. There are so many people that care deeply about each other and that motivates me to work towards even greater success for all of us. And with all that is going on across the country and across the world today, including the pandemic and the unjust burdens it has placed on so many, as well as the unrest of these past few months that has further illuminated existing social injustices and racial and systemic racism. I feel it is time that we further commit to who we are and demonstrate that we care for each other. We have the opportunity to be a bright spot within higher education where people know they are supported and can excel. To do that, we must be an institution built around a commitment to each other, compassion, and more importantly, love. When we put our love and appreciation of each other at the forefront, we commit to a shared vision of a very bright future for all of us, and one that will enable an inclusive environment where everyone knows this is their university. Getting there will involve transparent decision-making and caring leadership at all levels. I commit to building a strong leadership team that values the amazing qualities of this institution as much as I do, and to invest in our academic excellence and provide access to the highest quality education to elevate and promote UCF's excellence and national reputation, build a culture of trust, engagement and accountability, and of course, deliver on our diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. I look forward to building this environment and culture with you, one where everyone knows they are not only welcome, but celebrated. In doing this, we commit to being an elite university an elite community that will never be elitist. Thank you for being part of this amazing institution and for your commitment to making UCF the best that it can be for our students and for our internal and external communities. And with that, go Knights and charge on. Thank you, President Cartwright. So I must tell you a little story. When Dr. Butler came to us in a staff meeting back in late August about wanting a full week of activities for diversity week, I was thinking, um, nope, that is impossible. However, with the help of some amazing student assistants who I fondly refer to as the Jose's, we managed to plan the impossible. Thank you to Jose Marcano and Jose Hernandez Ortiz for your contributions to this week because without you, I would have been lost. Now, none of this would be possible without the support of ODI's fearless leader. Please allow me to introduce our interim chief equity and diversity officer, Dr. Kent Butler. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion is thrilled to share with the UCF community some extraordinary programming throughout the week from phenomenal keynotes and programming to prepare fine Colombian, Vietnamese, and Caribbean, more specifically Trinidad and Tobago cuisine. I'm just so thrilled with what we're going to be able to, to share with you all this week. I'm extremely excited about the video podcast we are launching this week as well, Matters of Diversity with Dr. B. It will be an opportunity to engage in fireside chats surrounding equity and inclusion. We will be airing the podcast live twice weekly. Wednesdays will be dedicated to the administrative side of the house as well as stakeholders from the Orlando community and beyond. Friday's show will be dedicated only to UCF students. And as you're interested in being a guest, we will have a Qualtrics form on the ODI site website for those members of the university community that may wish to join me. Our theme this year ironically speaks to the type of year that we are all actually having in 2020. When we came up with it, who knew? I think it's pretty visionary if you, if you ask me. Stronger together, 
unified, connected family. To fight the double and triple pandemics happening in the world, we had to come together, be there for one another. It was even in writing that we were hoping for this week, even in the writing describing the hope for the week, Martin Luther King proffered this, that individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. As a university community, we will find strength in each other, especially when we recognize that open and honest communication along with building of long lasting relationships lead us to experience our greatest achievements. We do not have the liberty or the luxury of ignoring the difficult questions that society places before us. We must deliberately sit down together at the table and ensure that every, and I mean every, voice is heard and respected while we address these challenging queries. For as Woodrow T. Wilson said, we cannot be separated in interest or divided in purpose. We gotta vote folks. We stand together until the end. It is important that we also recognize that when we embrace our diversity and embark upon social justice advocacy, we open the door to a world of infinite possibilities. And together, if everyone helps to hold up the sky, then one person does not become tired. The words of Ashari Johnson Hodari, we become one and are the undeniable orchestrators of the change we want and need to see in the world. At this time, I would like to recognize my amazing staff that are hardworking to make sure that the university lives up to its potential. So come, please help me recognize my team. And as I call your name, just maybe let your cameras come on and, um, and or say something so you, people can see you, because I'm not sure how we're viewing this right now. So Dr. Cynthia Muniz, our Director of HSI Culture and Partnerships. Hey, Cynthia, how's it going? <laughs> Doing well. Hi, everyone. Ms. Barbara Thompson, our Associate Director, does a lot of work for us right now. Hey, what's going on, Barbara? Not a lot, but I'm glad to be here, that's for sure. Ooh. You already met Ms. Kavita Sal, our coordinator. Let's say hello to Ms. Susan Layden, our Senior Executive Secretary. Susan, you out there? I thought I saw her out there. We also have Mr. Victor Nukaucha, our Graduate Assistant in charge of our Legacy Mentoring Program and Ms. Alexis Rodriguez, our graduate assistants overseeing the Career Futuros Mentoring Program. Are they out there? If they are, I'd like to say hello to them. All right. We also need to give a shout out to Ms. Hilary LaMountain, our graphic artists, and our amazing student workers and interns. They are not all online with us today, but I would like to recognize Jose Marcano. I know he's here. His camera's not working, but Jose is here and he's done a lot of great work. Jose Hernandez Ortiz, we call him Joey. We want to thank him. Valeria Cartagena Fagus, Christopher Campo, Asi Chico, Nacy Fernandez, Alexa Paratinio. Newly added to our roster are two phenomenal interns who work and will be seeing us through with our Matters of Diversity. Um, with Dr. B podcast as Aizan Bonifacasio and Isabella Marchetta. Last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce to the UCF community our newest team member, Ms. Flor Septimus. Flor comes to us from Pensacola and actually is pretty glad to be back on East Coast time. Hey Flor, how's it going? Uh oh, you're muted. Uh-oh, we had you on before we started this. But anyway, anyway, this is Flora. You're gonna get the opportunity to meet her. She is definitely going to be um, an asset to what we bring. So 
So very quickly, if everybody can come back on to the screen that's here, Barbara and Cindy and, and Kavita, this is your team, people. We are here for you. Any, any exciting words of wisdom coming from any of you? Barbara, I know that I'm going to have you speak a little later about a, a very exciting event we're going to be doing. Um, but anything that you all want to talk about right now before we move it over to um, our award ceremony? Uh, you are all muted. I just think that this year, more than ever, Diversity Week is so happy it's here. So glad it's here. Good. Excellent. 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 Cynthia, how are you doing? How was your weekend? You took a day off on Friday, so I hope you're rested. I'm doing well. Again, like Barbara said, you know, just very happy to be here, excited about all the various activities this week. Uh, you know, just lots of lots of room to grow, right? Learning never stops. So I, I just appreciate everyone who's participating this week and, and sharing some uh, some of the work that they're doing and spreading the knowledge and just I, Wish everybody well during this week and as we move forward. Excellent, excellent. I see you in the library. So um, pick up a book or two for us. Appreciate it. All right, Susan, I see you. I hear you. I can't see you. You out there still? It's not working for me. Uh-oh, it's not working for everybody. You can hear your voice. Say hello to the people. They can hear you at least. Hello, everyone. Happy Diversity Week. Thank you, Susan. And uh, Flora, Flora Septimus, um, is your vote, is your, is your um, sound working yet? Uh-oh, we're having trouble with Flora. So anyway, Flora is our new individual coming here. She's going to be a training specialist um, on our staff, and um, she's going to be able to work with Barbara and with our team to kind of just bring to you all the things that we are hoping that this executive order will allow us to continue to bring to you in regards to the work that we do. We're here for it, and we're going to continue being there for you all at the UCF community. And last but not least, Kavita, this woman has um, gone overboard with this week's planning, and so I'm just really excited that um, she's here and that she's doing this great work. And so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kavita so we can get started with our awards ceremony. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, I'm trying to hold back the tears there. Uh, the first award today goes to our Diversity Week student poster contest winner, Charles Tobin. Um, Charles was unable to join us today, um, but I wanted to say a little bit about him. Um, Charles was chosen as the winner by a committee made up of faculty, staff, and students for his amazing hands poster. His poster had so much fine and intricate details with such vibrant colors that United Trophy, the company we used to make the awards, was unable to etch the details on the glass of our awards. So about two and a half weeks ago, I reached out to Charles and without hesitation, he took on the task to create something usable for United Trophy. In addition to his commitment to diversity through his artwork, Charles showed us true teamwork when he took on the job of recreating something just for us to use on our awards. Thank you, Charles, for your commitment to diversity at UCF and for your willingness to jump in at the last minute to help us out. Um, I wanted to show you a quick picture of, our, just real quick, what his award looks like. That is what he made for us to use this week. Um, the picture at the start is um, the poster that won the award uh, competition. Um, now I will hand it back over to Dr. Butler to announce the Dr. Valerie Green King Career Inclusion Impact Award winner. Thank you. The recipient of the Dr. Valerie Green King Career Inclusion Impact Award is definitely one of UCF's shining lights. Regardless of the day, I do not believe you will ever really see this person without a giant friendly smile on their face. I have engaged in many conversations with this person and never have I ever heard them utter anything that has not come from a positive place. This year's recipient inspires many of the people that they come into contact with from serving on committees. And I'm sure she is spread pretty thin to do the incredible trainings and workshops she never fails to give her 
To boot, she is a UCF alum. Goes to show that UCF Knights go hard. I know you are waiting to hear who this person is. Well, I will hold back no longer. This year's recipient of the Dr. Valerie Green King Career Inclusion Impact Award is none other than Ms. Chantel Carter. Chantel, I know you're out there. Can you come on screen? Chantel is an Associate Director of the Office of Student Involvement focusing on outreach and inclusion. She also serves as an institutional representative for ACE Women's Network. UCF, their goal is to advance and support women pursuing leadership opportunities in higher education. And as I said, she serves on many committees. One that I have served with her on in the past two years is the President's Leadership Council. And what we do is we select the new members of the, of the council coming forward. One of the most thorough interviewers that I've ever seen her, her commitment to reading the resumes and application materials and keeping copious notes is hands down the best of everyone in the room. I often go to her and say, well, what do you have for this person? What do you have for that person? The last thing I would share is that Chantel does a program for ODIs entitled Appreciation at Work. Is, there a, is that a thing? Well, yes, it is. And here at ODI, we want to give her her flowers right now to show our gratitude. Well, maybe not flowers, but how about a beautiful optical crystal flame? Congratulations, Chantel, this year's most deserving recipient. Is Chantel out there? I am here, Dr. Butler. <laughs> I am caught off guard and surprised. I had no idea this award was coming truly you all did a great job in keeping this secret from me I just was given instructions that I needed to log on a few minutes early to yes. be available to try to witness what I could for this wonderful and fantastic opening ceremony for diversity week Kavita you are good you got me I had no idea but I am extremely grateful for the more than you know. And you too, Ken. Thank you so much um, to everybody. Everyone so many awards. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We'll be getting this to you. We're so proud of you. It means more than you know. Thank you very much. There's that smile, everybody. There's that smile. <laughs> Thank you, Chantel. Congratulations, Chantel. You are truly, truly deserving of that award. The Diversity and Inclusion Impact Awards are presented by ODI at the Diversity Breakfast every year. Unfortunately, this year, bacon and eggs are not involved, but we still get to virtually hand out the Impact Awards to a deserving faculty or staff, a community member, and a student. I would like to thank our awards committee for their very difficult task of choosing the winners. Here to announce the Faculty Staff Award is ODI's Associate Director, Ms. Barbara Thompson. Thank you, Kavita. So again, welcome. Welcome to Diversity Week 2020. So a little bit about the Faculty and Staff Award. The Faculty and Staff Diversity and Inclusion Impact Award is presented to a faculty or staff member who, among other qualifications, has exhibited evidence of extensive sustained participation in integrating issues of diversity, inclusion, cultural competency, and or multiculturalism in teaching, research, programming, administration, or community service activities. Further, the nominee shows leadership around the dissemination of information related to issues of diversity and inclusion. In her nominating statement describing this year's award recipient, Dr. Stacy Malaret wrote, she has advised multicultural student organizations and was instrumental in creating the Lead Out Loud Multicultural Leadership Development Program within LEAD. About 10 years ago, a group of Black student leaders approached her about needing a voice and outlet to learn, develop, and grow as Black student leaders. Hence, Lead Out Loud was born. Retreats, 
workshops and mentoring opportunities were created to assist the development of these leaders and it is still in place today. She also continues to meet with students who are not part of Lead Out Loud but have a mentoring need. She does not seek out recognition or praise, instead preferring to allow others to shine in the limelight, even though she worked very hard to get them there. I am thrilled to announce that the winner of the 2020 Faculty and Staff Diversity and Inclusion Impact Award is Dr. Jermaine Graham from the Lead Scholars Academy. Jermaine, I know you're here. Will you please turn on your camera? Hi, Jermaine. Congratulations. You're so deserving of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very surprised and very grateful um, for the work that I get to do every day. This is just a part of, of my life, my calling, and um, I enjoy working with students. And if they have a need, I'm going to meet it. Jermaine, thank you. And thank you for everything you do to help our students here at UCF. And congratulations on the award. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and congratulations, Dr. Graham. Here is a quick look at the award Dr. Graham will be receiving. I hope you all can see that. It's a little difficult, but thank you again. So thank you all for being here today. And I'm sure that we're all pumped for our keynote speaker, Dr. Sean Harper. Just as an FYI, we will have a quick intermission at the end of the award ceremony, just before Dr. Harper jumps on. So you'll have a few minutes to grab some water or let the dog out if you need to. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Cindy Muniz, Director of HSI Culture and Partnerships, here to announce the winner of the Community Partner Award. Thank you, Kavira. Muy buenas tardes a todos, a todas. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, it's such a pleasure to be with you all here and sharing this space. Um, congratulations to everyone who is being recognized uh, this afternoon. I have the great pleasure of presenting the Community Partner Diversity and Inclusion Impact Award, uh, which is presented to a community partner who has demonstrated an extensive commitment to enhancing diversity and inclusion efforts at the University of Central Florida through strong collaboration. This year's award winner has consistently participated in UCF events and partnered with our diverse student organizations since opening their Maitland office in 2016. They have participated in UCF career services programs specifically developed to support our diverse student populations. Some of these include Dare to Dream alumni and industry panel, the LGBTQ employer panel, and Vet Connect, to name a few. Their active involvement has resulted in 70% of their campus hires being from underrepresented backgrounds. Nominated by Lisa Pavon, the 2020 Community Partner Diversity and Inclusion Impact Award goes to ADP. With us today representing ADP is Michelle Tunsil. Michelle? Hi, hello everyone. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hi, <laughs> and thank you. Um, yes, thank you for the nomination and the recognition. And thank you to um, Lena Pavone, our talent acquisition business partner for nominating us and representing ADP in a special way. Um, we value diversity and we make that our focus when we hire and recruit. And this has driven a lot of our recruiting efforts at UCF. Um, so it's rewarding to see our efforts be recognized within the local communities. So on behalf of ADP, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, well, thank you for, for your work that you do and for your partnership. We appreciate that and congratulations again. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Muniz, and congratulations to ADP. So here's a quick look at what their award looks like. And our last but certainly not least award is our Student Impact Award. Here to present this award is the SGA Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator, Daniela Lopez. In their nomination letter, the award winner was described as an exceptional leader who has changed the landscape of diversity and inclusion on the UCF campus and beyond. At the core of this award winner's ethos is a desire to make a significant impact and connect with the underrepresented populations, specifically within the disability and low income communities. Our award winner was nominated by two individuals and the second person had to say, all things considered, when I think of an individual that has taken the initiative to be an advocate for diversity and inclusion on campus in the community, I think of a model representative of the university who epitomizes the all that UCF stands for. The 2020 Student Impact Award goes to Taylor Duffy. Taylor was nominated by Andrea Doster and Carly Blades Miskowski. Congratulations. Wow. Well, first off, thank you so much, Daniela, for the kind words. Um, thank you, Andrea and Carly Miskowski for nominating me. Um, this is such an honor to be recognized alongside such amazing leaders on campus as well as off campus. Um, and I think this is just amazing because this is something I love to do. Um, and to be honored for something I love to do um, is amazing. So I think it's all our responsibilities to continue pushing diversity and inclusion understanding that this pushes our communities forward. Um, but once again, thank you so much. I'm very humbled and uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Daniela, and congratulations again, Taylor. Thank you to all our presenters and congratulations again to all our award winners. Award winners, I will reach out to you next week to talk about getting your awards to you. I will now hand it back over to Dr. Butler to talk a bit about our week acti of activities. I hope to see so some of you at our events this week. Go Knights, charge on. Thank you, thank you. And congratulations to all our winners. It is really great that you have been a part of our lives here at UCF and you're doing this phenomenal work. And we just stand with you. And we, we are really excited about what your paths are going to continue to bring not only to UCF, but to the, to the world. And we're looking forward to all those changes. So we're really excited about this week. This week we had opportunities to um, talk with a lot of our stakeholders on campus to be a part of this because we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We knew that we were gonna be on campus, of course, but we didn't know that there was gonna be this pandemic. And we did not know that because of the pandemic, we would have to try to do this in a very, very interesting fashion. And so I got an opportunity to see what was happening at other universities and, and other companies around the world about how they were dealing with just Zoom and other platforms to kind of get the message out there, right? So we're on a campus that has partial opening, so to speak, and we have about 30% of our faculty and staff and students working on campus. But we knew that we could not, because of social distancing, have the type of programming where we can all be together and enjoy one another and see each other and hand people their awards and give them their flowers in person. And so we decided, as Kavita has shared with you earlier, to kind of see what we can come up with. And everybody at UCF who's a part of our programming this week rose to the occasion. Uh, I said that, you know, I want to bring in a, some dynamic speakers, and I'm so excited that we have our first kickoff keynote with Dr. Sean Hopper. Uh, you all are going to be amazed. He brings, he brings the noise. He brings it all. And so we're, we're going to really have an opportunity to hear from him and his expertise about equity and inclusion. And I'm so, so excited to hear what his message is going to be to us at UCF. Other things that we got going on, um, the library, university library has been a part of our diversity week experiences. And so those of you who have got a chance to look at our schedule, you'll see that they're doing things like diversity in comics. That's gonna be at three to four today. And 
there's a woman of color working on campus panel that's going to be hosted by Dr. Karma, Karma, I'm not saying it correctly and I apologize, Campbell Monsell. And um, we're just really excited about what she's going to be bringing. And also um, on tomorrow, we're going to have uh, an LGBTQ community um, event hosted by Elizabeth Smock. That's going to be at 10 a.m. Um, we're going to do something that's really exciting this week. Um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at lunch hour, we're going to have the opportunity for people to cook and do like a cooking show, like an HGTV cooking show, which Kavita came up with. And she's going to have a couple of her colleagues on campus to do Colombian food, um, Vietnamese food, and Trinidad Tobago food. Um, they're going to be cooking it. And so if you're still interested, um, you can still sign up. Um, they will forward you the recipes and the shopping list. And you can go and you can cook alongside of them and have a phenomenal meal on, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Another thing that we're really excited about is um, I brought in some interns and I had this idea of doing the video podcast and we're going to be launching it this week. The purpose behind the podcast is to kind of talk about equity and inclusion on our campus. So I want to bring some of our leaders on campus, faculty members, staff members, administrators who are doing this work. People like Taylor, who is out doing this work to talk about what it's like to be doing this work and um, to hear from them and to keep the community really updated on the things and the progress that we have with regards to diversity and inclusion. We don't want to be that university where people are saying, well, I don't know what's happening. and They need to be more transparent. And with the support of Dr. Cartwright, we are definitely doing the, the justice to bringing UCF up to speed at all times on things that are just that matter, things that matter. And so diversity, um, is going to be at the forefront, but I want to have opportunities for anyone to come and be a part of this. The other thing that I want to bring up is that we have Dr. Ivory Tolson, who's going to be speaking as a keynote as well on Wednesday. And he talks about uh, bad stats. And he talks a little bit about what it's like to kind of use bad stats in the wrong manner and how we can improve upon them um, and look at them from different perspectives and really do the work that we need to do to kind of help those communities that are marginalized and oppressed to do better. And so with that, I'm just going to pull back and ask you all to look at our website and um, see all the beautiful programming that we got going on. Shout out to Takara. Takara is going to be doing a special with um, other women around um, leadership on campus. Um, I also have Dr. Ann Schildenford Butler, who is going to be doing um, a presentation on the not so incredibles and, and what it's like to live in, in, in the margins of the black families. And so um, please be on the lookout for that as well. Um, so what we're going to do right now is take about a 20 minute break and we're going to have an opportunity for you all to kind of go as Kabita has shared and um, just refresh yourselves and maybe do some stretching. If you're going to do a quick 10 minute walk, maybe some Pilates or anything along those lines, go knock yourself out, but come back because right at one o'clock, we're going to be introducing our keynote for today, Dr. Sean Harper. And I'm telling you that you will not want to miss this. So we will see you around one o'clock. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back to our Diversity Week kickoff. Um, just a few housekeeping tips. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions of Dr. Harper. Um, if you know anyone who's experiencing trouble getting on um, during the keynote onto Zoom, um, you can have them access uh, the keynote through the UCF YouTube account. Um, I am going to introduce you to um, Barbara Thompson again to talk a little bit about Women's History Month. Thank you, Kavita. I um, just want to share, wanted to share real quick with everyone, Women's History Month is March of every year. And um, a lot of you know that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion offers a wide range of certificates. Um, you know, you complete a, a package of courses and then you can earn certificates. Probably our most important one and the one that we're really seeing a, a lot of people interested in is our Inclusion Champion Program Certificate. In fact, um, we're almost at a thousand people who on campus who have earned that and it's, it's available to students, faculty and staff. Um, I wanted to mention that means we have about a thousand inclusion champions and you'll be seeing an invitation going out to these individuals to please submit um, your ideas for um, some kind of programming during Women's History Month. So it would be a presentation by you, the inclusion champion during Women's History Month. And it can either be on a Women's History Month topic or on any kind of topic in diversity, inclusion and equity. So we'll probably be putting something up soon on our website so that you can fill it out and submit to be a presenter during the month of March. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing back from lots of the inclusion champions. Thank you very much, Barb. So I will now hand it over to Dr. Butler for the remainder of the program. Thank you all, Dr. Butler. Greetings, and um, I'm so excited. I hope you all are ready. And um, to introduce our keynote today is Dr. Jonathan Cox. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology here at UCF. He actually is um, really good friends with Sean Harper, and so um, it makes sense to have him be here. So Dr. Cox is a race scholar. Um, he's interested in racial and ethnic identities and racial ideologies. Uh, he is a proud noop which is a Kappa, and, uh, and he is a proud graduate of Hampton University with his master's in um, student affairs uh, from Penn State, and um, he got his PhD from the University of Maryland. So without any further ado, and to introduce our phenomenal keynote speaker for today, please, everybody, appreciate in the way that you can, Dr. Jonathan Cox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. I really appreciate that. And it is definitely my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today during the kickoff of UCF's Diversity Week. Now, I'll make this short because I know we want to hear what uh, Dr. Harper has to say. And then also we would literally be here for hours if I were to recount all of Dr. Harper's story accomplishments. And so briefly, Dr. Sean Harper is one of the nation's most highly respected racial equity experts. He is a provost professor in the Rossier School of Education and the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. He also is the Clifford and Betty Allen Chair in Urban Leadership, founder and executive director of the USC Race and Equity Center, 
president of the American Educational Research Association and a past president um, of the Association for the Study of Higher Education, um, as well as an editor at large for Time Magazine. As I said, very, very storied accomplishments here. Um, on a personal note, as Dr. Butler said, um, I've known Sean personally for more than a decade now. It's been a very long time. Um, and it would be no exaggeration for me to say that Sean has really helped me end up where I am today. Um, in fact, I might actually be understating it significantly. Now, he has been instrumental as a mentor and a colleague, and I feel incredibly blessed to also count him as a friend. So please help me give a warm, virtual, and nightly welcome to Dr. Sean Arthur. Professor Cox, thank you so much for your amazing friendship, for the scholar and person you are, and for for such a generous and really warm introduction. I'm really proud of you, um, as you know, but everybody else should know that you're my favorite UCF <laughs> faculty member. Um, I hope they award you tenure there. Please award him tenure. He Jeez. should be a tenured professor there um, in the not too distant future uh, because Jonathan brings so much to your academic community and to his field of sociology. And he's such a brilliant thinker and person. You should tenure him. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that would be a great thing. Well, hey, everyone else, it is really terrific to spend this time with you um, to kick off your diversity week. I'm sorry that we're doing it virtually. Um, I wish that I were there in Orlando with you in person. Nonetheless, uh, we will have, I think, a really good experience here today. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm also thrilled that you have my dear friend and brother, Ivory Tolson, uh, coming later this week. I'm just grateful that I get to go first um, to be Ivory's warm up act. You are for sure uh, in for a real serious treat with uh, Professor Tolson. Um, I also, last but certainly not least, I would like to thank, uh, thank Kavita for reaching out, inviting me formally, for being the person corresponding with me these past several weeks. Kavita, it's been really a pleasure to collaborate with you. And I'm glad that we were able to bring your vision to fruition. Without further ado, um, I am going to go ahead and get us started here um, today with the uh, keynote kickoff for your diversity week. Let me just say uh, two really quick things. Throughout our time together here today, you will hear me often say we, us, and our. I realize that I'm the only person addressing you at this time. When I do that, I'm speaking on behalf of the collective we here at the USC Race and Equity Center, the colleagues with whom I have the privilege of doing my work every single day to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion in K-12 schools and districts, colleges and universities, businesses, firms, and community agencies all across the United States. Uh, so I hope to represent them well um, here during my time with you. We just had a spectacular weekend here at the center. We collaborated with two other research centers here at USC for a weekend long three-day event on racism in America that attracted more than 4.2 million people for three days of live streaming. Uh, so I'm definitely, you know, riding high from the success of that event. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, I thought a lot about, you know, what might be an appropriate way to frame the kickoff for this year's diversity week. Um, you know, the direction that I've chosen, I think is really responsive to the times. It's responsive to the movement in which we currently find ourselves. If this were Diversity Week 2019, I likely would have gone in a very different direction. As you might imagine, given the work that we do here at the USC Race and Equity Center, I have a multitude of choices, right, of things that I could talk with you about as it pertains to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've published 12 books. All 12 of them are about diversity in higher ed in some way. But I decided that it might be most useful in these times, in this movement, to talk with you about becoming an anti-racist University of Central Florida. You all may have noticed that there's a lot of conversation right now here all across the United States and indeed around the world about racism in all of its forms. Since the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, 
lots of people have become suddenly intrigued um, in you know, trying to figure out ways to become personally anti-racist. So many of them went out and got Ibram Kendi's really amazing book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And they read it from cover to cover to figure out, you know, very quickly, you know, what they could learn to become individually anti-racist. But I want to bring an institutional frame to today's Diversity Week kickoff beyond individual notions of being anti-racist. What can a university and a university community and academic departments and divisions and offices and student affairs and the admissions office and the athletics department, what can you know those various divisions, entities, organizations, and so on that comprise your great university do as a collective to become anti-racist? Before we get into it though, I wanna make sure that we all arrive to this conversation with the same understanding of the current movement. Notice that I didn't call it a moment, but instead a movement. What is the movement about? What is it that people have been protesting in the streets since the first week of June here in the United States and around the world? Indeed, it was in fact the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor that sparked the movement. But to be absolutely sure, the movement isn't just about the murders of those two particular Black Americans, but it is also in response to longer standing patterns of police violence and police terrorism in Black communities over centuries. The very birth of the industry that is now known as law enforcement was born of slave catching, where armed white Americans went on the hunt for enslaved Africans here in America who were attempting to escape the brutal horrors for slavery and they were given mandates to bring them back dead or alive. That was the very birth of the industry of law enforcement, right? That didn't end with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. It didn't end during Reconstruction. It didn't end during Jim Crow. It has persisted through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and indeed the 2000s. So what we're seeing people you know, take to the streets and to social media and other places where they do their activism, what we're seeing and hearing them say is enough with the police killings, enough with the racial profiling of unarmed Black people here in America. But the movement isn't just about policing. It is also in response to other patterns and systems of both structural and systemic racism, white supremacy, and anti-Black racism here in America. Yes, in our judicial system, in our legal system, but also in our healthcare system, in our economy, in our housing, and for sure, in our educational system. So we're, in other words, we're hearing protesters, activists, allies, and supporters say enough with the placement of Black people at the bottom of just about every statistical metric of well-being, progress, and performance across all of our industries here in America is a thing that we spent these past three days talking about in our national event that, 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 that we did here, um, you know, in collaboration with the three centers here at USC. We brought a, a systemic framework to helping people understand the interconnectedness of housing, wealth, health, education, and other social forces. Last but not least, what are people protesting? They're protesting inaction. Inaction on long-standing racial problems here in America. They're protesting inaction on racial inequities that have long been documented at universities like mine and yours. Year after year, in data reports from our offices of institutional research, we see that people of color and employees of color, students of color, staff of color are on the losing end of racial inequities year after year, but yet there's too little strategic action at colleges and universities. We're hearing protesters and others say enough with the inaction. We want to see serious measurable change and progress on problems that have long been made known to us 
by sociologists like Jonathan Cox and others who uh, do the brilliant work of producing, you know, social science and, you know, other forms of science that show us that, you know, there are myriad and pervasive and persistent uh, racial inequities. I wrote a piece in the Washington Post about two weeks after the murder of George Floyd and shortly after the murder of Breonna Taylor. Um, you know, if I had to go back and retitle the piece now, you know, like four months later, I probably would retitle it Black Lives Suddenly Matter with a question mark. But as you can see here, I actually titled the piece Corporations Say They Support Black Lives Matter, Their Employees Doubt Them. As Jonathan mentioned, I'm a professor in two schools here at USC the Rasir School of Education and the Marshall School of Business. So this piece was really written, you know, from my perspective as a business school professor and from my research with companies and firms. I start the piece by talking about how many corporations were doing these like flamboyant corporate gestures to somehow suddenly convey that black lives are important to them. The CEO of JP Morgan Chase, for example, was photographed in front of a Chase bank kneeling, taking a knee with, you know, employees of that branch. Mm, not sure that we've ever seen him take a knee before. That was symbolic. Then, you know, we saw these other corporations making these headline busting uh, announcements of their investments into Black Lives Matter, Black communities, Black-led organizations, right? Bank of America gave a billion dollars, billion with a B, and lots of other organizations were giving, you know, multi-million dollar, you know, uh, gifts and, and, and making investments. Those are all good, right? I'm not suggesting that those particular gestures were meaningless. Uh, it's great that CEOs were using their platforms in that way. It's great that companies were, you know, putting dollars into the advancement of, you know, causes that were confronting anti-Black racism. There's one more thing that I mentioned in this article that corporations were doing, but also universities and colleges all across America were doing, right? Many CEOs were writing corporate statements. Sometimes there were emails that went to all employees of their companies. Other times they were statements that were not just emails, but were also placed on the website. And in other instances, you know, some corporations even took up full page ads in the New York Times and in other places to declare that the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor was awful, that racism is really, really bad. And some of them went so far as to even declare that Black Lives Matter. College and university presidents were writing some version of those same statements to members of their campus communities. What I was hearing from Black employees in corporate spaces, as well as from Black students, Black faculty, and Black staff members in higher ed as they read those statements were, hmm, this statement on the one hand is laughable. On the other hand, it's absolutely offensive. Why would they say it's offensive? Isn't it great that our president like boldly stood up and you know used his, her, or their platform to you know decry that that, that racism is terrible? Isn't that like great? Like, shouldn't we be happy? The, the, the thing is, right, many black folk across industries, including ours, um, you know, we're like, but but wait, like this email I just got says that Black Lives Matter, but my everyday experience here confirms for me repeatedly that Black lives don't matter here. There's tremendous carelessness for Black people and for Black lives in this institution, in this organization and so on. Why would they say these things, right? And was this just like a sort of all of a sudden emotional reaction, you know, in the height of the 2020 tension around race and racial inequity? Nope, uh, nope, it wasn't trendy. It wasn't, you know, in the moment. How do I know this? Because I've been hard at work at these things over the entirety of my faculty career. Uh, for, I've been a professor now for 18 years. For all 18 of those years, research on campus racial climates in higher education has been the centerpiece of my scholarship. 
I, along with researchers from the center uh, that I founded in direct, have done qualitative campus racial climate assessments at more than 50 colleges and universities uh, all across the United States. You see here 15 years, I'll tell you why that says 15 instead of 18. Um, we've also done these qualitative studies across a range of institution types, large public research universities like yours, small liberal arts colleges, community colleges, religiously affiliated institutions and so on. Um, across geographic regions, I often say, as a matter of fact, of our qualitative climate studies, that they've literally taken us from Princeton University to Portland Community College um, and several you know, dozen other institutions you know, across the country um, by type, size, geography, and so on. We have interviewed now more than 10,000 students, more than 10,000 students in person on their campuses for our qualitative uh, racial climate studies. That work typically entails going to a campus for three to four days and doing seemingly nonstop monoracial focus groups with various groups of students of color, as well as with white students. We always, always include white students in our campus racial climate assessments because they too are indeed part of the racial climate of the campus. But we do these focus groups in homogeneous fashion. So we'll have several that are just with white women, several that are just with white men, several with white gender non-conforming students, several more with black women, black men, indigenous students, uh, Latinx students, multiracial students, Asian American and Pacific Islander students, so on and so forth. So doing them in homogeneous ways allows us to get a collective sense of how each particular racial and ethnic group might be particularly experiencing the racial climate um, in a particular way. That work, the qualitative work over the years, you know, focused on assessing students' sense of belonging, uh, mattering and inclusion on their campus, both inside and outside the classroom. Um, their encounters with racism ranging from racial microaggressions to more overt forms of uh, racial harm and racism. We tried to get a sense always of the uh, extent to which students were interacting meaningfully across diversity. What a shame that so many colleges and universities um, you know, spend so much time thinking about and you know, to varying degrees working on uh, manufacturing a diverse student body but yet we get that diversity and we have no educational strategy for it. We don't leverage it. We don't figure out how to make good strategic educational use of the diversity. We just magically, we, we just presume that if we just magically throw hundreds of students from different racial and ethnic groups into a residence hall, that they're going to magically interact across difference. No, actually they just go and cluster with people who are like themselves from their same backgrounds is a thing that we certainly have uh, found quite consistently over the years. Lastly, we try to get a sense of if students think y'all are serious, right? We invite them to offer appraisals, their appraisals of institutional commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. As you might imagine, given the work that, um, that I've been doing and that we as a center have been doing over the years on these topics, there's been a tremendous and frankly overwhelming uptick in the demand for our qualitative racial climate studies. It's why the number says 15. When we got to the 15 year mark, you know, we started to get really overwhelmed. You know, honestly, um, you know, we can pinpoint this in time, right? It was around 2015 that we started hearing and seeing such a desperate outcry for us to come to campuses and do these qualitative uh, climate assessments. It even exacerbated, the demand became even greater uh, during the 2016 election and like post 2016 election, it has just been like really out of control, the demand, right? In large part because the racial climate of the nation has had a spillover to the campus racial climate um, at colleges and universities. So the truth is, you know, we ran out of capacity 
to go and be at a place for three to four days um, because too many people needed us um, given, you know, again, the racial temperature and the racial climate of the nation. So here's what we did um, in response to that demand that was so overwhelming for the qualitative work. The National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates, also known as the NAC, is a quantitative survey that will be administered annually at hundreds of participating colleges and universities across the United States. Through the NAC, thousands, perhaps millions, of college students will offer useful insights into the realities and complexities of race in higher education. NAC respondents will help us understand how various populations differently experience the colleges and universities they attend, where and what they learn about race, their feelings of preparedness for citizenship in a racially diverse democracy after college, and how racial issues in our broader society affect interactions and experiences on campuses. The USC Race and Equity Center will help institutional leaders use NAC survey results to improve racial climates, college experiences, and student outcomes. We took the 15 years of qualitative research and qualitative data to inform the constructs of this new national quantitative uh, campus racial climate uh, survey, which allows us to serve so many more institutions and meet their needs for data on the realities of race on their campuses. Um, the NAC officially launched in February, 2019 and it has since been administered to more than a half million college students at community colleges, as well as at four-year colleges and universities all across the United States. This year, this academic school year alone, the NAC is on track to be administered to approximately 1.4 million undergraduates um, all across the United States. We spent some time this summer updating it to include some questions about COVID-19 and about learning in uh, remote and uh, digital environments. So, you know, this is the work that we have been doing, um, you know, over the years, both quantitatively and qualitatively. In the interest of time, I'm going to share with you now a few experiences. You know, as you can imagine, uh, given the duration of time that I've been engaged in this research, I could go on and on for the entire diversity week, like every day, all day for your diversity week, talking with you about what we have found. But in the interest of time, in the confines of this hour long keynote, I wanna talk with you about, you know, nine consistent findings. And I decided to situate these in classrooms in part because class is the place that every student has to go. Class, especially in you know, remote and hybrid learning environments right now is where all students are. Um, you know, they're not in the student union right now on many campuses or you know, hanging out in residence halls and you know, casually on campus. So I decided to talk about nine classroom experiences. I also decided to focus on classrooms because frankly, I started my career as a student affairs professional. And I understand that you know, those who do work in student affairs and in diversity and inclusion spaces, you know, have to end up helping students recover, especially students of color, recover from the racial trauma and the racial harm that they experience in classrooms. So here are nine encounters with what I call classroom racism. Um, so over the years, both in the qualitative research and, you know, we're certainly seeing this being corroborated in the NAC quantitative uh, survey results, students of color talk about curricular erasure, meaning that if you're an Asian American student, for example, you know, you'd be hard pressed to read anything about your own cultural history, cultural identity, and cultural interests um, in, you know, most of your courses. We hear the same thing, obviously, from Indigenous students, Black students, Latinx students, multiracial students, and and you know, other minoritized students. So the point here, right, is that you know, students do not feel a sense of belonging in their classrooms because frankly, there's too little that is done in the curriculum to confirm that they belong, to confirm that their people are important. When in fact their people are represented, it's almost always in a one-sided deficit way, right? You know, Black students talk with us about being, you know, incredibly 
embarrassed on the one hand and just frustrated on the other that, you know, when there are, you know, conversations or readings in the class, in the curriculum about Black folks, why Black folks always got to be broken? Troubled, represented as a problem in America, right? Imagine being a Black woman student in a class and, you know, the only thing that you're reading and hearing about your people is all deficits, right? What about the beauty and brilliance and resistance and resilience of your people? You know, students of color tell us that it makes them not want to go back to that class and certainly not want to be engaged in a class where, you know, their people are only being misrepresented as problems. Another thing that we constantly hear from students of color is the burden placed on them by their faculty members as well as by their classmates to be the spokesperson for all people uh, of their you know, particular racial or ethnic group. Imagine you know, a Latinx student, you know, anytime anything comes up in the curriculum or in a class discussion about Latinos, Hispanics, Latinx people, you know, people turn to the one Latina in the room and expect her to be the spokesperson on behalf of all her people. Even worse, there are times that students of color tell us that they're expected not only to be, you know, the spokesperson on behalf of all Latinas and all Latinx persons, but all people of color, like, or all poor people, right? Like, you know, they're, I'm just reminded, uh, honestly, of a focus group that we did, you know, just before the pandemic, where there was a Black woman student who was like, yeah, like they turned to me and asked me, you know, to be the, like something came up about the ghetto and they like turned to me. I'm like, why y'all turned into me? I, I grew up rich. But the presumption was because she's black that well, certainly she knows about urban poverty. She knows about the ghetto. Um, yeah, this is a common experience that many students of color have in predominantly white classrooms uh, where they are expected to speak on behalf of everybody, um, you know, who's not white or who's not rich or middle class. Here's the thing that students tell us happens often. They're confused for the other student of color in the class who, with whom they bear no resemblance. It would be like a professor, you know, calling me Jonathan Cox and calling Jonathan Sean, like Jonathan and I look nothing like each other. I'm far more handsome than he is. Uh, but yeah, like it happens all the time. You know, students tell us that, yeah, their faculty members, you know, confuse them one for another. Look, let me, let me like extend some grace here, right? I've been a professor for 18 years. I understand how hard it is to learn people's names. Uh, look, it takes me a while. Sometimes I don't get it until like mid semester. Zoom's been really helpful though, because you know, you see their names in their little Zoom squares. Um, that's been like real clutch for me. But the point here, right? And the point that students of color make in our research with them, it's not that the professor, you know, seemingly is bad with everybody's name. The professor somehow learned all the white people's name, all those, all the white students, they don't seem to confuse them. So why is it that they that they confuse us, right? It ain't but three of us in the room. Um, it would seem that statistically, it would be a whole lot easier, you know, to not mix up the three of us, right, is a thing that students talk with us about. Then there is, you know, if you're an Asian American student or an Asian international student, you know, like, you know, the professor keeps mispronouncing your name. Or if you're an indigenous student or a Latinx student or a black student with a name that is culturally unfamiliar to the faculty member, they keep mispronouncing your name in, in, in class. Uh, imagine, right, we're gonna connect this to sense of belonging, sense of mattering, as a matter of fact, let's make it about mattering. Yeah, you don't feel like you matter if your professor can't seem to get your name right. Or if you're an Asian international student and the professor's like, yeah, I just can't learn your name. Could you pick an easier name, an American sounding name uh, that's easy for me to pronounce, right? It's not that the American sounding name is easier, it's that the other name is culturally unfamiliar to you and you're too lazy to go and learn, you know, 
how to actually pronounce the student's name. Yeah, it's a particular experience that many students of color um, across racial and ethnic groups, but most especially Asian um, international students, you know, often tell us they experience. A couple more, um, an encounter with classroom racism, the shortage of faculty of color is experienced as an act of classroom racism. I realize that that may not be clear to you. You may ask yourselves, well, how is it racist that you know there are just not a, not a lot of people of color in the classroom who are faculty? All right, here's the thing. The higher education workplace, as many of you may have noticed, is racially stratified. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that people of color tend to be largely concentrated in custodial, groundskeeping, and maintenance roles, food service roles, low-paid secretarial roles um, on campuses. Obviously, the people who perform those roles are absolutely uh, deserving of our respect and appreciation for the professionalism that they bring and for the contributions that they make to our campuses. But the point here is that if you are a Latino student and the only other Latino men that you see on your campus or the only other Latinx persons that you see are all cutting the grass and sweeping the floors, but yet you don't see any of them in front of you and in front of your classmates or in department chair roles or deanships or in leadership roles in the student affairs division or athletics or admission or other parts of the university and certainly not in the president's cabinet, it conveys to you as a, as, as, as a young Latino man, man or person on the campus that yeah, like yeah, our, our people don't really matter here. Our people aren't really respected here. Look at how they treat the people, by the way, who work in these, in these roles that are you know, at the least compensated, least powerful uh, positions, they don't care about us is a thing that we often hear. So therefore, you know, again, not having many faculty of color. In fact, look, many students of color tell us that they could go through their entire four, five or six year undergraduate experience and not have a single course taught by a person who's the same race as them. Yeah, that doesn't make them feel affirmed, validated, that they matter, that their people matter at the university. A couple more here. This is a thing that happens when faculty are surprised, when a student of color performs really well on an exam or writes a really eloquent paper, you know, sometimes, as a matter of fact, those students of color are accused of plagiarism because no way, no way a Native American woman could have written this paper that's so eloquent, right? Um, it's, it's a real jab. It's a real blow to their intellectual prowess, right? It makes them even question, well, like, am I as smart as... I thought I was, certainly my faculty members don't seem to be, don't seem to think that I'm as smart as I actually am. Sometimes this happens in the form of a backhanded compliment when a professor would say to a student, you write really well for a black student. The implication there is that black students don't typically write well. The implication is that you are exceptional, you are a credit to your race. You see, the thing about that is really offensive because that black student has siblings, a mother, a father, grandparents, aunts and uncles, black people in their communities who are also black, right? So you're saying that where I come from and the people who are important to me, that those people are not smart, that I'm the smart one is offensive. It's a thing that happens way too much. Uh, two more here. Many Black students and Latinx students and Asian American and Pacific Islander students and Indigenous students tell us that they encounter racism. Sometimes they go to the professor. Sometimes they go to the department chair. Sometimes they go to the dean. 
or to the provost office. Sometimes they run it all the way up to the president's office to you know, report that we have, here's an alert, we have a racist professor in our political science department. Like we, we want you to do something, but yet there seems to be no consequences for that racist political science professor or wherever that person teaches. Look, let me not be a hypocrite here. I very much enjoyed my tenure and I understand that it's really hard to fire a tenured professor. I understand that. I understand that sometimes the thing that students want to be the consequence is to fire the person and that you can't. But the point here is that they say to us that they're not just mad that you didn't fire the tenured professor, but there seems to have been no other real serious action or any other serious act of accountability on behalf of the institution. It really frustrates them. It makes them believe that you actually don't really care about them and that their lives actually don't matter um, because there is no real concrete consequence. Last but not least, um, and again, these aren't the only nine, by the way. I mean, I, I could go just like on and on. I won't, but I could. But the ninth one here that I just selected, right, is that there is no acknowledgement of racism when it occurs in the classroom. Like a classmate might say something that's like incredibly offensive and students of color are like, wait, professor, you're going to, you're gonna check that, right? You, you're, you're, wait, wait, hello, did you just hear what that person just said about a whole race of people? It's, it's absurd. It's like, it's like really racist. And, you know, students say that, yeah, um, it becomes clear to them at times that the professor actually realizes that a person has made a really problematic statement and that they like start fumbling, that the professor starts fumbling and, you know, gets like really anxious and like very quickly, like, you know, tries to move the conversation on without addressing the thing that just occurred. Imagine the psychological, emotional and academic harm that does to students of color when their professors mishandle these racial moments in classrooms. At other points though, so again, sometimes it's really clear to, um, to the student that the professor realizes. Sometimes, by the way, side note, um, in our work with faculty, faculty members across different racial and ethnic groups, by the way, not just white faculty, faculty members will also say to us and me um, in our research with them that, yeah, when these moments come up in my classroom, like I just like try to like move on like as quickly as possible because I don't know what to do. Why do I not know what to do? Because I was never taught how. I was never really taught, actually, uh, higher ed's dirty open secret that most faculty members were never taught how to teach, period, in their PhD programs, um, let alone, you know, teach in ways that equip them to solve racial problems, make good educational use of racial tension when it occurs, you know, productively help another student realize how what they might have said, um, you know, is offensive racist, so on and so forth. They're like, yeah, I, I, I didn't learn that in my PhD program. So yeah, I'm just definitely not gonna take that on. All right, other times though, look, students give their professors the benefit of the doubt that yeah, maybe my professor didn't even realize that what was said was problematic, racist, offensive, had an impact on students of color. But that doesn't excuse, right? Like, you know, ignorance doesn't excuse them from, you know, doing something about it. So we cannot be willfully ignorant. We got to learn how to do these things. So look, um, I told you that we were going to talk here about, you know, how to be an anti-racist University of Central Florida. Let's do that in these last 15 or so minutes. Uh, let's talk about what anti-racism requires of us as individuals, as well as as a collective university. Um, I wrote a piece back in June um, at the height of the, 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 of the protests that we were all seeing across the country and around the globe. And as you can see here, the title was Black Lives Matter According to Meg. You see, if we're gonna become 
anti-racist, we have to recognize our own contradictions. I have not yet met a college or university president, provost, dean, or department chair who said to me, I don't care about diversity and inclusion. I don't care about, you know, about equity. They all say they care about these things. Most faculty colleagues of mine here at USC and during the decade that I spent at the University of Pennsylvania and, uh, you know, colleagues, not only at places where I work, but, you know, at other, you know, institutions that we work with, faculty members say to me and to my team here at the center, we're so committed to diversity and inclusion. My student affairs colleagues say, I'm so committed to diversity and inclusion. But we got to recognize how sometimes what we say doesn't match up with what we do and how that creates contradiction. So in this piece, Black Lives Matter, according to Meg, I started out by talking about a white woman named Meg who got with three or four of her girlfriends, all of whom are white. They got together on a Saturday, they made their Black Lives Matter posters and they took to the streets to participate in a march for Black Lives very proudly with their, with their posters. They were like stopping occasionally for selfies, right? Just capturing the moment. They wanted everybody to know on their social media and elsewhere that they were out there Meg and her three girlfriends marching for Black Lives. On Monday, when Meg got to work, you know, she was in a meeting with her team. And Meg was passing around her cell phone, you know, for people to see, to scroll through her pictures. She wanted her colleagues to know that I was out there. I'm a social justice, racial justice warrior. I was out there this weekend marching for Black Lives. You know, see, here's the problem, though, with Meg. Meg ain't got no Black people on her team. The Black people that were in Meg's division all left because of Meg's racism. Back in February 2020, the Black employees came to Meg to ask her for $100 to buy food for their Black History Month event. And Meg was like, yeah, no, I, I don't have it in my budget. And yeah, if I give you $100 for Black History Month, I'm going to have to give $100 for Hispanic Heritage Month and then in June, like the LGBTQ employees are gonna need $100 for Pride and then there's Women History Month. Like, sorry, I don't have $100. This is the same Meg that was marching like, you know, five months later in a march declaring that Black Lives Matter. She didn't have $100 back in February for the Black History Month program, right? We gotta recognize the ways in which we say that equity, diversity, and inclusion is important to us. But, you know, there are these contradictory actions, these everyday experiences that people have with us that very much call into question the credibility of such claims. So I want you to ask yourself, right? This begins with a conversation with oneself, a reflective conversation. Am I anything like Meg? We're gonna convince ourselves that no, like Meg sounds awful. She sounds a mess. She sounds like she's not like really serious. I'm nothing like her. How do I know? How could I be so sure that I'm not contradicting myself as a staff member, administrator or faculty member here at the University of Central Florida in the way that Meg was contradicting herself? How do I consistently affirm that Black Lives Matter? Not just the poster that I got displayed in my office from that one protest that I participated in that one afternoon back in June. Not just the one, you know, lapel pin that I have to say that says that Black Lives Matter, but how do I consistently affirm the mattering of Black Lives? What was I doing in June 2019? 2018, 2017, to affirm that Black Lives Matter? What am I going to be doing in 2021 to affirm that Black Lives Matter beyond this current movement when, you know, it's like sort of like on trend 
to be a person out there like declaring that Black Lives Matter is so trendy. That's mm, yeah. What am I gonna? What, what? How am I going to keep this going in a way that really is an exercise of of serious integrity for faculty members who claim that Black Lives Matter or that equity, diversity, and inclusion are serious imperatives, are serious commitments of ours. Does my syllabus confirm that commitment? Or if you're a person who works in res life or in student activities or you know elsewhere, does the programming that come out of my office actually confirm my commitment to people of color? The syllabus though, I'm gonna go back to faculty. You look, I can like talk badly about faculty because I am one, like I'm not, look. The syllabus is a real serious like receipt, right? Like you could look at the syllabus, like it is a thing that could actually be, uh, we have these syllabus review rubrics that we've created here at the USC Race and Equity Center, by the way, where one can analyze one's syllabus. Oh, it might tell you real clear that now you are definitely not committed to what you say that you are, given the readings and the assignments and the authors that you've chosen to privilege um, in your syllabus. Just a couple more reflective questions. What would my students of color or what would my colleagues of color say about my commitment to anti-racism? If they knew I was out there marching in a march for Black Lives there in Orlando, would they be surprised? Would they be like, wait, say what now? Or would they be like, absolutely, of course, that person like consistently shows up for racial justice, of course, that person was out there marching or would they be like, you've got to be kidding me. It's a question that I think we should ask ourselves. Just two more. Actually, it's just one more, All right, two more. Happy diversity week at UCF. Happy diversity week 2020. One reflective question might be, how do I contribute to or undermine UCF's campus diversity efforts. Beyond diversity week, by the way, um, don't just think about your contributions this week, but like, what about the other, you know, 51 weeks of the year? How do you contribute to the advancement of UCF's equity, diversity, and inclusion imperatives in serious, deeply meaningful, measurable, and sustainable ways? This is a reflective question for your consideration. All right, last but not least, how do I spend my time with people? How much time do I spend with people from different racial and ethnic groups outside of work? It's a question for your personal consideration. You see, at many institutions, there are these institutional declarations and institutions espouse commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Because we work at those institutions in those departments and so on, right? Like we believe that we're contributing, right? Um, here's the thing. Many of us spend time at UCF, which is diverse, but then we get into our cars and we drive home to neighborhoods that are segregated racially. Most of us spend our time outside of work at night and on weekends with people who are from the exact same racial group as ours, not just our family members, but also our friends. I'm not sure that one can live such a bifurcated life where diversity is a part of your day job, but there's no investment in it in your night and weekend time spending. That seems to me to create like some real like dissonance that, you know, ultimately 
doesn't allow uh, professionals to show up, um, you know, sort of fully and wholly, um, you know, committed to these things. All right, look, here's some things that you can do um, to engage in anti-racism as, you know, everyday acts, everyday actions there at UCF. Certainly you have to, for sure, talk with others um, in your respective departments, divisions, um, and places of work there about race and racism on your campus in Orlando, in America, historically and contemporarily, right? We believe really strongly here at the USC Race and Equity Center that you're going nowhere fast in actualizing uh, the ideal of racial equity if you can't talk about race or if there continues to be a code of silence on the campus around talking about racial issues with one's uh, colleagues. The work of racial equity, uh, reading is fundamental to that work. You have to read about race and racism in America, in higher education, right? Um, not just as an individual act, but we all together as a, as a faculty or as a staff within a particular unit ought to be reading you know, the same books or the same articles or the same inside higher ed piece. You know, think about an inside higher ed piece, and I know this for sure, is that the average read time for inside higher ed piece is four minutes. How do I know? It's the very first thing I do every morning when I wake up. I reach for my cell phone and I read inside higher ed. Uh, inside higher ed, there are two pieces in there today about racism. Two, today alone. But at least like once a week, at least once a week, there's something in there about a racist situation that has occurred at a college or university somewhere else. Shouldn't you be reading that as a collective? Shouldn't you put that on your agenda for your next faculty meeting, your next staff meeting to you know, learn from these situations that are occurring elsewhere, figuring out together what went wrong? you know, And most importantly, how can you ensure that this thing that happened at another place never happens there at UCF? Yeah, I think you should. Um, Third, you have to, anti-racism requires disruption. It requires that you disrupt racist speech, racist thinking, and racist actions, and racist systems and structures. You gotta do it in conversations with your family members, with your friends, with your social media followers, with your students, and with your coworkers. It requires action. Every year, in one of the courses that I teach here at USC, and I did this you know, um, every year during my tenure at Penn, I would have students identify throughout the semester three moments to disrupt racism that was occurring around them. Every year when I describe that um, assignment, you know, students say, uh, Professor, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna have three. I, the people that I'm around aren't, aren't really racist. I don't, I don't know like that I'm gonna be able to find three. Yeah, by November they found three because you know, like they, it was an assignment and they were forced to look at things that were happening around them that they otherwise would, you know, just like normalized, right? Um, so the, the point here, right, is that they not only have to find these situations, you know, things that their family members were saying or doing or their social media followers or whatever, but they also have to disrupt. They have to like raise the consciousness of those persons of the racism that um, was occurring. All right, a couple more, actually like three more. If we are going to disrupt racism on campuses, we gotta know what the truth is about the ways in which students, faculty, and staff are experiencing the racial climate. We have to understand the experiential realities that our students and colleagues are having with race. So we have to ask through, look, participate in the NAC. That would be one way. Um, our center's campus racial climate survey. That'd be a way to get you some data into the experience of uh, of students. We're hard at work right now on two additional national climate surveys, 
one focused on faculty and another on staff and their experiences in the workplace racial climate. Look, even if you don't do it with us, you got you have to assess the racial climate there um, in one way or another um, for students, faculty and staff and actually do something with the data. So you have to use the data to help your campus community understand the racialized experiences of people of color. Don't go out and do these climate assessments and like nobody like ever sees the results. You have to make the results transparent and you have to make them actionable. You have to help the campus community understand the truth about racial problems and racial opportunities, opportunities for UCF to deliver on the promises, the espoused uh, commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Six, on many campuses, we place the burden of disrupting racism and dealing with racial problems and so on on people of color. We gotta stop doing that. White folks have to step up as well and assume leadership for addressing racism on campuses. It cannot be just the people of color who are you know, charged with or expected to you know, engage in the unpaid emotional labor of helping the institution, um, you know, again, enact its espoused commitments. Last but not least, as an act of everyday anti-racism, if UCF is in fact going to become a credible anti-racist institution, it must denounce white supremacy unapologetically. It can't be a, but, uh, but, 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 but what, what do you mean by that? But, but, but uh, could you clarify? But, but it has to be a clear, unapologetic denouncing of white supremacy in all of its forms. White supremacist propaganda, white supremacist groups that um, aim to contaminate your campus community, white supremacy in the curriculum and in hiring practices and in promotion and uh, employee review uh, processes in the tenure process, there has to be a consistent, clear denouncing of white supremacy. All right, look, I hope that this has been helpful to you as you, you know, move forward with your school year, as you move forward with this diversity week. Let's not do diversity in the abstract anymore, right? Um, so many institutions for so many years have had diversity weeks like yours. Look, this is not a jab at diversity weeks. There is a thing though about diversity that is imprecise. This current movement requires us to be specific, right? I'm going to argue to you as we close here that the specificity that this particular moment requires, it requires you to talk specifically about race and racism, not just about cute diversity in the abstract. That's how you become anti-racist there at UCF. Hey, I'll turn it over now. Thank you so much for being a wonderful virtual audience. It was a real pleasure to be with you. Sean, Sean Harper. All right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And John Cox, really appreciate you spreading your knowledge here at UCF and giving us an opportunity to hear it from a different perspective. That's one of the things that I think happens a lot of times is we, we have these conversations sometimes in, on campus and the people on campus who are doing this work are not necessarily seen um, for the for what they can bring to the table. So I like the fact that you shouted out Jonathan Cox as having the ability to kind of be on this campus doing the work that you're doing at USC. Um, I'm on this campus being able to do that work. So can you talk a little bit about what is what's it like for you to kind of go to these various campuses and and give your all to this movement and to and, and your life work is in this movement. Um, 
what's it like when you hear maybe they're not following through? And, and what, what is your role in helping those entities kind of follow through um, when they say that they want to be anti-racist? Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Um, first off, thanks for your leadership and thanks for having me. Um, you know, one of the things that's important to us here at the USC Race and Equity Center is sustainability. Um, we try not to give institutions and organizations just like quick fixes, like here's this one-time thing that you can do and voila, uh, magically, you know, racism or gender inequity or whatever is going to magically disappear. It doesn't happen that way, right? Like it requires strategy and intentionality and data uh, and accountability. So, you know, in our frameworks, when we're working with institutions, we bring all of that to the table and we expect institutions as partners to commit to, to all of it, right? Um, again, here's the, here's the list, um, you know, the implementation of good ideas, assessment, accountability, communication, resourcing. Um, I may have said assessment already. Um, sustainability and institutionalization. Those are the, the key ingredients that we believe are important for institutions. Look, I, I, I will tell you that, you know, I sometimes run into a colleague at a conference who will say, bravo on that work that you did with us you know, back in October, right? It's March, had nothing happened here. <laughs> you know, like that makes me feel like we've wasted our time. Right. You know, I wrote a piece in Insight Higher Ed now about five years ago that it was, it's titled Paying to Ignore Racism. And it is about how colleges and universities sometimes literally pay our center 20, 30 or $40,000 to work with them on mm. racial equity things, and they literally do nothing with the work. What a shame that you wasted your money that way. And what a real shame that you wasted our time in that way, right? Like, we're not in this for the money. We're in it for they the They were work. being made. They were being made. Right? right, right, right. You know, like, honestly, like not to sound self-righteous, but we're not in it for the money here at the USC Race and Equity Center. Ours mm -hmm. is a, overwhelmingly um, majority people of color organization, we're in it because we care about these issues. Uh, so yeah, don't waste our time is, you know, what, what, what we say to people in the- So, so go, I want you to go back to that resources line. Um, can you kind of reiterate for the people in the back of the room, um, what we're talking about when we talk about resources? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, it's called put your money where your mouth is. Um, it's called um, investing in equity, diversity, and inclusion, like we invest in other things. You know, let me take this out of the university space for just a second, right? Um, let me see if I can make a connection here. So in the corporate work I do, I say to corporate executives every week um, in my work with them, right? That you have to invest in the diversity and inclusion infrastructure in the same ways that you've invested in your financial infrastructure for your company. You hold your CFO accountable. Let the CFO not um, get the financial model right. And like suddenly, right, like you have forfeited millions of dollars that you thought you were gonna get. Yeah, that CFO is gonna be fired. Yeah. You know, we expect people throughout the company to report their performance, not just annually, but quarterly. We hold people accountable for meeting their sales goals in their annual performance appraisals. Yeah, just imagine if we did the diversity and inclusion work with that same, um, with that same level of intentionality and accountability, we'd be much further along. But we also we we got to put money into it. All right. Sure. I would, so I could, you know, comment a little bit on that as well. I think, you know, we're talking about the idea of monetary resources being put forth. This is something that folks obviously need to do. Um, but additionally, some of the discussions that I've been having, and I know other people around the university and other places are having as well, is other, it, it speaks to this idea of accountability that you were just talking about, right? And so like what, when we say that diversity and inclusion are important, right, you were discussing things like your syllabi, you know, what's in it, what, what, what's in the syllabus that you have for your class, all these different things, right? We have, um, so one of the things I've been pushing is we have these ideas about promotion and tenure specifically for faculty. 
And if, if a department or an area is saying that diversity and equity, right, racial justice, et cetera, is important, it's an important factor of this, then why is it not connected to the promotion and tenure guidelines, right? And what would that look like if that was an embedded part of what we were expecting our faculty to do such that you could not even get promoted if you weren't engaging in this type of action, right? I don't yeah. know if you found something similar to that in what you've been looking at, Sean. Yeah, no, this is really good. Um, so I chair the University of Southern California's Committee on Promotion and Tenure, the university level committee in the social sciences. So as the chair, I'm obviously thinking a whole lot about this, right, for my own university. Um, you know, Jonathan, I'm thinking about this in at least three ways. One of the ways is exactly what you just said, that, you know, when we talk about teaching, research, and service being the things that, you know, we're going to evaluate, well, but yet, like, we're out here in presidential speeches and in all of this rhetoric everywhere else talking about diversity and inclusion also matter, but yet there is no expectation that one brings concrete evidence of contributions to the advancement of those goals when they submit their tenure dossier. Yeah, you're right. Like, nah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't tenure them without, um, you know, demonstrable evidence of commitment to that. Or we just gotta say that we, maybe this shouldn't be an option, but we should just like stop saying that this is important to us. If it's important to us, you hold people accountable for it. You expect them to bring evidence. You know, the other, the, the other way, another way that I'm thinking about this, Jonathan, is that I'm writing a piece right now on indicators of anti-Black racism in the tenure and promotion process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a question um, that when you go up for tenure, um, and you're gonna get it, I'm, I'm confident. But when you go up for tenure, you know, they're gonna get external reviews. They're gonna invite people to write external review letters. One thing that is typical in external review letters is the person is asked, you know, would this person get tenure at your university? Look, <laughs> um, there's something quite problematic about asking somebody who's never tenured a black person, would you tenure this black person in your universe? Y'all don't know how to tenure black people. So why, why would I ask you if this person is going to would get tenure? You wouldn't know, right? I'll give you one more that's in uh, on my list of, um, I'm gonna make y'all wait for the actual article, but I'll give you one more. There's a presumption that, you know, if say once, list of journal articles has Negro in the title. That, oh, that must be a second tier journal. That must not be a good journal, blah, blah, blah. Or if it has diversity in the title or Hispanic or you know whatever in the title that it must not be good. No, it means that it's culturally unfamiliar to you, right? It means that your predominantly white faculty don't publish in those journals. So therefore they presume them to be you know, lower quality. You know, one of the things about the Journal of Negro Education is that W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the greatest thinkers of our time published routinely in the Journal of Negro Education. Let me go a, a step further. Jonathan, you mentioned that I'm currently the president of the American Educational Research Association. Every black AERA president, there are now 11 of us. All 11 of us have published in the Journal of Negro Education. Mm, I, I, I hope that that makes it a credible journal. Um, Ivory Tolson, your other speaker this week is the editor in chief of the Journal of Negro Education. How about we not presume it to not be a high quality journal? It is, but it's just a thing, right? That in the tenure process, people are like, I don't know this journal, so therefore it must not be good. Yeah, mm, yeah, we gotta stop that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll quit, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> no, that's really good. It's heartwarming to hear that. Um, though I've gone through the tenure process four times now, three times um, at different universities and then here as a um, full professor. Um, to those people who are watching on Zoom, if you have any questions for Dr. Harper, please add them to the chat uh, or to the question and answer, because um, we really want to be able to do that. So, so what do you do when you don't have to deal with all this racial tension and strife and, um, and all those other things? Is there ever a moment in your life where you know you, you, you can just chill and just be Sean Harper? Yeah, yeah. So look, I go to bed at 1030 um, pretty much every night and I wake up at 730 pretty much every morning. 
Um, so, you know, nine hours of sleep for me is an unapologetic, deliberate act of self-care. Um, so there's that, you know, I watch lots of TV with my husband and, you know, pre-pandemic, I was out here in these LA streets that go into restaurants and Lakers games and sporting events, USC games. Uh, yeah, I, I, I am very, um, usually, the pandemic has been just like a different like time and space for me. Um, but usually I'm very good about compartmentalizing, like all of this racial stress and stuff that we're doing at the USC Race and Equity Center. When I get in my car at 515 and I drive away, I'm leaving that stuff there, right? Like, it's just like not going to, you know, pretty much like take over the rest of my life. Like I, I, I try to be like very intentional about that. The problem with the pandemic is that working from home has not allowed me to create the kinds of boundaries that, because I literally live where I work right now, which is just right. like not good. Right, 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 right. I also, I also, I also DJ, um, which, DJ. Yeah, which is fun for me, mm -hmm. right? Like I love making people think, I love making people act on uh, yeah. the things that I care about, but nothing brings me more joy than making people dance. Ah. Now that's, let's see, just drop the mic on the dance. I don't know what to <laughs> ask you. Johnson, um, talk a little bit about you and Sean and your relationship in terms of how you all, how you all met and, um, and how he's inspired you. And then I was, you know, want to know from Sean, you know, what's some things that we need to know about Jonathan um, oh, geez, that um, might good. help us out <laughs> in the tenure room? Sure. I mean, I could just a, a little bit again, you know, like I said, I've known Sean for, I, I don't even know that I, I had to really think about how long exactly because it's been a while. Like I said, just more than a decade is what we'll call it. Uh, but one of the things that I've always really appreciated about Sean is, you know, he's, he's talking right now to everybody about, you know, universities and different institutions doing things, right? They, they, they espouse these beliefs all the time, right? That they, they love diversity, they're, they're champions of inclusivity. Um, but then often they kind of fall short of what they do. And I think Sean has always been somebody who has always put his, you know, proverbial money where his mouth is, right? In whatever form money would take in that sense. I um, mean, I think one of the biggest ways that was one of the things that connected us um, was his work with black men, right? You know, he's uh, again, been a, a major champion for years uh, about uh, that, the other side of blackness that he was talking about earlier, right? We always talk from a deficit perspective. I mean, so a lot of his work on black men is specifically from a perspective of, uh, of, of the positive things. What are men who are succeeding, black men who are doing well doing, right? And so a part of that research was just the, kind of this collection in a sense of all of these different black men that he's spoken to, engaged in research with, um, trained up, helped mentor. And so I was one of those people, right? I was, as we met where he was doing a study on high achieving black men um, back when I was at Hampton University, right? And so that just kind of started off the, the friendship and the relationship from there, got me into grad school. Um, I was already headed to higher ed. We figured out that I hadn't applied to the program that he was working for. And so, you know, just through things like that was what really ended up pushing me forward in my career into student affairs, right? So for the people who don't know me as well, um, before I became a faculty member, I worked on the other side of the aisle, I guess you could say, as an uh, administrator for, for years, right? And a lot of that was due to a lot of the things that, you know, Sean was able to help really build up in me in terms of, you know, finding a space for that, figuring out what I wanted to do, and then moving forward into that. And so he's been able to do that with so many people, you can't count them, right? In particular, again, Black men. As a Black man, I think that's one of the things that I would say is most significant, um, because we do know, right, that not only do people of color not often see faculty members or other mentors that look like them, right? Uh, we know that black men in particular, that is like, there's hardly any when it comes to higher education because of the number of degrees uh, that, you know, that black men are able to obtain. We all know there's a lot of structural factors that, that make that really problematic for black men. And so to see that, right, for me, that was just a, an incredible space. And I think that he's been able to do that for so many other black men. I mean, I have so many other friends that I'm connected to that are black men. Uh, a lot of my circle are PhDs, EDDs, other people with masters, uh, all these higher ed degrees or people who are working in the field. I mean, that was the space that I think that really just kind of helped develop the friendship and I've always admired him for because again, as a black man, that's something I look to do too, is to look back and pull up as many people as I can because I know that I did not do this alone. Absolutely not, right? I know that nobody on this call or nobody that's looking will be able to say that they did it by right. themselves, right, right, if they're honest. 
I'm so this is a question practice. that came in. Uh, I want to ask Sean real quick, and I think it kind of ties into what I asked him about you. Um, but what, what the, the question is from someone in student affairs, and they want to know how can we attract students of color, biopic um, individuals, um, to our events that are open to all students? Do we need to change the event name um, to make it culturally appealing? Um, I know we need to reach out to them where are where they are, but do you have any ideas for us? I do. Um, before I answer that question, I just want to quickly answer your question. You invited me to say something about Jonathan. He's yeah. an actual genius, right? Um, as he mentioned, it was research that introduced us. He was a participant in a research study of mine. That's how I met him um, back in spring uh, 2006. And I knew he was a genius at that time as I interviewed him for my study. And then I had the enormous privilege of being his professor. And, you know, I was just evolved into just an amazing friendship and collegial relationship over the years. And I've just been so proud of him. Um, you know, I've now served on 101 doctoral dissertation committees. His was one of those uh, when he was pursuing his PhD at the University of Maryland. Um, and, you know, I just continue to watch his career with tremendous pride and, you know, any university would be enormously lucky to have him on his faculty, which is why I feel so strongly that UCF better tenure this man, uh, cause he is a real asset to your community. Um, you know, the question about, you know, attracting more, uh, students of color to events. Um, I have, I have actually several, several reactions. One is that you should ask them, right? Like put together a council of students of color that represent a range of racial and ethnic backgrounds and so on to give advice on how to make events and you know, student engagement programs and activities you know, more culturally appealing. If you ask them, they will tell you. You could also leverage some of them as influencers um, within their respective communities you know, to bring uh, more of them to the table. Um, you know, third, right, is that the content has to be, you know, culturally inclusive um, and culturally responsive and culturally relevant, right? Um, you know, that's, that's important. A fourth thing that I'll say is that in most student affairs divisions across the country, there is no strategy for this. You have to have a strategy that has goals, that has you know, outcomes that you wanna measure, how you're gonna measure those outcomes. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's important. You know, too few divisions have a strategy, a formal written strategy. Um, so yeah, you gotta you gotta sit down at the table with your colleagues, with your students, with folks who know a lot about Black students, like Professor Cox and 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 other students of color who can help you create a, a strategy, not just like here are two things that you can do. Yeah. The the last thing, let me let me be like unapologetically self promoting for a moment. <laughs> uh, one of my books is titled Student Engagement in Higher Education. Theoretical Perspectives and Practical Approaches for Diverse Populations. Each chapter in the book is about a different population of students. And it lays out the population specific needs, experiences, and outcomes for that respective uh, student group. And then most importantly, it gives tons of recommendations that are customized for engaging that particular student population. So in other words, like spoiler alert, our thesis in the book is that a one size fits all approach to engaging students doesn't work because various groups have various needs, experiences and outcomes. So you gotta first understand those and then program to the specific, um, you know, populations, which, you know, again, the book gives tremendous guidance on how to do that for each of the, I think, 22 populations are written about um, in the text. Very nice, very nice. Jonathan, you have a question for 
Dr. Harper. You're, you're on mute. So this is just, just oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, so you can hear me now, my apologies, I had mute myself. Um, so one of the questions that seems to be coming through on the chat um, is just asking for suggestions for working with student groups that maybe don't care or don't seem to care about diversity, equity, and inclusivity, right? So how do we get those groups? And I would argue even uh, faculty and staff, right? To see the value of creating really inclusive spaces for all students. Yeah. Um, I spent so much time here talking about classrooms and what happens in classrooms, because again, it's the place that every student has to go. And I was talking about racialized experiences of students of color, specifically in classrooms. But let me say, right, that white students who participate in our climate studies tell us that they don't learn anything about race either or about people of color or about, you know, different racial histories, unless they trip and fall into a sociology of race course or an ethnic studies course. Um, so, you know, the classroom is where this has to be done with higher degrees of intentionality where we have to, you know, like expose students and engage students in, you know, like a, a curriculum um, that focuses on these issues. But I've also written about how we gotta have also a curriculum outside the classroom. Yeah. You know, like we've like long taunted this thing that we call a co-curriculum, this imaginary co-curriculum. It's like a long, it's like an old school, like student affairs phrase that, yeah. you know, we are educators in the co-curriculum. Well, uh, the sociology curriculum, at some point, a group of sociologists got together and they decided, what does one need to learn about sociology here at UCF to get a degree in our program here? Step two, among the five or however many of us are at the table, faculty, who knows what? Who's the expert on this particular strand of sociology? Who is the expert on this other strand? Then those persons assume responsibility for then developing out the curriculum and developing specific courses in the sociology curriculum. Let's go even a step further. Every person then had to create a syllabus for their course that had learning objectives, readings, and assignments that would permit us to determine that, okay, this person, this student has learned enough about this particular strand of sociology um, in this course, um, and they're gonna get an A, a B, or whatever, an F in the class, right? right. We hadn't done that in student affairs, <laughs> right? Like we haven't gotten together to determine what is it that we want our students to know as we prepare them for citizenship in a diverse democracy um, after their lives and experiences here at UCF? What are the ways in which we're going to, you know, design and deliver learning experiences outside the classroom? Who, in terms of offices, in res life, student activities, um, Greek life, and elsewhere, who, um, you know, like has the expertise on these various things that we want our students to know? And then how are we going to put together, you know, a set of programs with clear learning outcomes, perhaps even things for students to read and experience, and then how are we going to assess that they learned and that the outcomes were actually uh, accrued? Um, yeah, that is, that's what's needed. So listen, we only have a few more minutes with you and we appreciate your time. There are three questions that are in the chat. I'm gonna read all three of them to you and tell you to pick the one you want. Okay. Um, if that's something, all right? So all right. how do you advise responding to those who insist denouncing white supremacy is infringing on their free speech or that institutions of education should be neutral, even if their neutrality relies on false equivalency. The next one is, what are the best ways to bring attention about concerns we have about higher level administrators' behaviors related to DE and I um, concerns? And then the last one, oh God, there's another one that came into. Um, thank you 
for your presentation and dedication. I look forward to reading your book on early childhood education and its impact on black male student success. Would you I'm share with that one? Uh, that's <laughs> my favorite. Uh, thanks for that. Wait, 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 wait. So would you share your thoughts on the most recent executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping and how has how it has impacted your work? And then the last one is you can go back to the other one. That's fine. How would you advise students on what they can? Oh, I think I did that one already. Oh, oh, how can you advise students on what can be done? when no consequences have been brought to a racist instructor who continues to spew dangerous rhetoric. All right, so um, your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm gonna go with that one about this ri ridiculous executive order. Look, it's a distraction. Um, and all I'm gonna say without, uh, you know, turning this into a partisan affair, uh, please vote. Vote. Absolutely. Nice. Vote. vote. Yeah. Well, you just said it very clearly, very succinctly. Jonathan, um, anything that you want to share with your good friend um, before we close out for the day? No, oh, he's I think we're, I think we're good there. All right, Dr. Harper, um, it's coming up, it's 2.30. I don't want my behind the scenes people to come yell at me because I went over um, by too much, but it has truly been a joy. Um, I told, um, my assistant, Kavita, and I'll let her come on to say hello to you really quickly. I know that, that she would love to do that. Um, how, how, how phenomenal you have been with regards to um, having your time spent with us, um, that you came through for us, and, and, and I really, truly appreciate it. Um, Thank you. I'm going to get with you about the prism and some other stuff you got going on. Um, Sean, I mean, Jonathan's been trying to connect us, so we'll, we'll definitely be able to do something. But I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. Um, um, I know you stand on the shoulders of your ancestors and those who came before you. Um, I want to partner with you and walk side by side with you in the work that you're doing. Um, UCF is coming up, and we're going to do the we're going to do the thing. We're going to do it the way that you kind of shared it out. Uh, we've already done a climate survey. Um, and we're going to make sure that there's actionable things that come from it. And I think you have spoken a strong truth to us. And, and I really appreciate you um, knocking it out the park for us. I don't know how Ivory going to come and be able to do anything on Wednesday. No, um, Monday, Monday, was the, Monday was on it. Don't worry. Ivory is going to be spectacular. <laughs> but seriously, thank you. Thank you for all that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Kavita, anything as you send us off? Nope, but thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Harper. It's been a pleasure working with you. Likewise. Thank you, Kavita. All right. So thank you, everyone. Please join us for the rest of the week. It can't just be um, today, and um, but so many good things that are on our plate, and we appreciate you, but I'm going to sign off now so that we do not um, get into overtime. Here we go. Have a great day. Thank you all. Please reach out if you have any questions about Diversity Week.